Okay, if you're here for an emotional uplift this morning, uh, <laughs> we're in right. We're going through the Book of Revelation, and we're right now we're we've been spending a lot of time on the uh, tribulation, and uh, you know that this is a time of judgment and suffering on the world. Of course, the church will be in heaven, but uh, those who are left behind are going to go through a terrible seven-year period of tribulation, and that's what this is all about. So, by the way, I hope you all had a good Valentine's Day last Sunday. You know, we didn't have church and everything, so I suppose you had a good time to just be together and everything. So, I hope that was really special for you. At any rate, uh, two Sundays ago then, I preached, uh, well, sort of a two-part series here called The Two Babylons. And uh, we had part one last week, and that's the fall of religious Babylon which is the worship of the Antichrist. You remember in chapter 17, the harlot was riding the scarlet beast, and it turned out that that scarlet beast was the Antichrist. And so that's what that was two weeks ago. And now today we're going to finish that with part two, talking about the fall of commercial Babylon, and that's chapter 18. And what that's all about is the worship of money and the things that money can buy. And so this is looking at today... God's judgment on commercial Babylon. You know, I, I guess I knew somebody that people called Babylon because that's what she did. But anyway, not a true story. But the message here is that commercial Babylon will be destroyed. You know, it's interesting that from Genesis through Revelation, there's this war between God and Babylon. And you say, well, what's wrong with Babylon? Well, Babylon represented... Um, going against God. It, it went against everything that God is and stands for, but it, 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 it was a picture of idolatry and occultism, demonism, uh, immorality, and all sorts of things like that. And so this is why God was at war with, with Babylon. But it goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation. For example, there are three rises and falls of Babylon. The first one is in Genesis chapter 11, right there, clear back in Genesis. And you know, there's a fellow by the name of Nimrod. And if you uh, have, you know, have baby boys born to you and you want a Bible name for them, don't pick Nimrod. Okay, because what do you say when you, you walk into a place and there's a, just a big mess and you say, oh, some Nimrod did that, you know, or somebody cuts you off in traffic, oh, that Nimrod. So don't name your kids Nimrod. It's not a very good Bible name. But Nimrod, in defiance, really, of what God had told the people to do, founded the city of Babylon. And uh, God had told them to scatter throughout the world. And yet, he, by, you know, by founding this city, he's saying, no, we're not going to scatter. We're going to stay here. And then, of course, they built the Tower of Babel. It was to be a tower to reach up to the heavens. And before God finished, you know what God did. He confounded their languages. He gave, I think, probably every, each person a different language. And uh, they tried to work together. They couldn't understand each other. So they ended up scattering like God told them to do. But um, so that city of, Nim of uh, Babylon then went into ruin. So that is the first rise and fall of Babylon in the Bible. And then the first five chapters of Daniel. You remember that the southern kingdom of Judah, because of their sins, was taken into captivity in Babylon. And uh, this was the time of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So there were some very godly young people in that society. But as a whole, the society had really turned against the Lord. So there they are in the Babylonian empire. Daniel was a young man. Uh, the king of Babylon at that time was Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar kind of got to be friends um, but Daniel had a dream, you remember, about a tree that got cut down, and, but they put a band around the stump of that tree, and it was a brass band, and you remember that brass is a symbol of God's judgment mixed with mercy, and it meant that, well, he lost his mind for about seven years. They put him out literally in a pasture, and he ate grass for seven years and didn't know anything, and then his mind came back to him, and he was put back on the throne. So that was God's judgment mixed with mercy. But after Nebuchadnezzar's reign, there was another king named Belshazzar. And Belshazzar, in Daniel chapter 5, threw this great big drinking party. 
And that's what it was. It was just a big kegger or something. And uh, everybody was just really drunk as they could be. Well, that happened to be the time when the Medes and the Persians decided that they were going to attack Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, Belshazzar, he was too drunk to fight. All of his generals and his captains and his soldiers were too uh, drunk to fight. And so um, the Medes and the Persians easily crushed the Babylonian Empire. So there's another rise and fall of Babylon in the first five ver uh, chapters of Daniel. And then, of course, now where we are today, we see in Revelation 17 the rise and fall of religious Babylon, and in chapter 18, the rise and fall of commercial Babylon. So why is God judging Babylon so severely? Well, he's sort of like a prosecuting attorney. He's out here in the courtroom, and he's laying out his case against Babylon. So the first 10 verses, we see God's case against Babylon, and uh, as he's laying out the case, let's look at the, the crimes. First of all, her first crime, well, let's take a look at the first three verses. After these things, that is, after, after religious Babylon has fallen in chapter 17, after these things, I saw another angel. Now, remember that uh, in chapter 17, one of the angels that had been carrying, there were seven angels that had the golden bowls, and, and they had the judgment that was poured out upon the earth. Um, one of those angels came and spoke to him about religious Babylon, and now a different angel, but it's a, another angel. In the Greek, it's alos, A-L-L-O-S. It means another of the same kind. You know, you, you've heard of alloys, you know, in metals, or if you're at war, you kind of like to have some allies. Well, this is alos. It means another of the same kind. <clears throat> another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And I saw that, and I thought, is this an archangel? But he doesn't say it's an archangel, and he doesn't say it's Michael or Gabriel. But it says he was a, another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he, now notice here, it was illuminated with his glory, and he cried out mightily. You know, I've said this before, but uh, angels are not beautiful women with halos and wings. That's just not it. Uh, angels are never identified as women. I don't know where that idea ever came from because in the Bible they're always identified in a male gender and, and they have male names like Gabriel and, uh, and Michael. So he says in verse 2, he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. Now why does he repeat that? Why does he say is fallen twice? Well, the first is fallen is chapter 17, the fall of religious Babylon. And the second is fallen is chapter 18, the fall of commercial Babylon. And so he says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the dwelling place of demons. And so this is the first crime, I guess we would call it, is involvement in demonic activity, according to verse 2. Some really bad satanic stuff must have been going on. And we know it was because Babylon was known for involvement in occultish activities. And so that's the first thing. Verse 2, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. I've only heard that about Los Angeles, but uh, I guess that's not exactly what it says here. Like the cage of every unclean bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So the second thing, the second crime is sexual immorality. I mean rampant, unbridled sexual immorality. You know, um, it kind of sounds like our society today, really. And then the next thing is extreme self-indulgence. So we have involvement in demonic activity, rampant, unbridled sexual immorality, and then extreme self-indulgence, the last part of verse 3. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And we're going to see that repeated now down through this chapter, all the way down. So there's this... this uh, Self-indulgence. In other words, commercial Babylon stands for the worship of money and the things that money can buy. 
and it involves extreme self-indulgence. Now, I need to say right away that it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to have nice things at all. Um, you know, I was listening to Greg Laurie. I haven't been able to listen to him much, but I happened to catch him the other day when he was interviewing Daryl Strawberry, a great baseball player, a great legend in baseball. And uh, Greg says, well, you know, you've really been very successful, and uh, what's it feel like to live in a real nice luxury house and drive a nice luxury car and everything and nice luxury clothes? And Daryl Strawberry is a Christian, of course, and he said, uh, he said, Greg, he says, I've got a luxury house, all right, but it's a house. It does what a house does. It gives, you know, protection from the weather. It, it's a place for family to gather and so on. It does what any house does. He says, yes, I drive a luxury car, but it does what a car does. It gets me from this place to, to the next place. And uh, uh, he didn't say this, but he could have said, and, and yes, I, I wear luxury clothes, but they do what clothes do. They keep you from getting arrested. So at any rate, what he was saying is, look, I've got wealth, but I don't worship it. This is not my God. And I think that it's not wrong to be wealthy. There are many people in the Bible who were heroes in the Bible who were very wealthy. It's just uh, that you don't let it become your God. So extreme self-indulgence. And then her negative influence in verses 4 through 10. So uh, in verses 4 and 5, there's a warning. And this warning is to the tribulation saints to separate from her. That is from commercial Babylon. So take a look at verses 4 and 5 with me. He says, and I heard another voice. Now, what is this voice? Well, I think it's an angel, another angel. But this angel will be speaking for God, almost like a spokesman for God. Yeah, because it sounds like God is speaking. And then he's going to speak about God very briefly. And then he's going to speak to God. So uh, keep that in mind. Otherwise, it gets a little confusing. But look at the first part. Verse 4. He's speaking for God. I heard another angel, or another voice rather, from heaven saying, come out from, un come out from her, my people. So it sounds like God is speaking. Otherwise, why would he say my people? But I think the angel is speaking for God. Come out from her, God uh, of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and now he speaks about God. He says, God has remembered her iniquities. So this can't be God's voice. This has to be an angel's voice. And he's warning these people to separate. Now, you know, it's possible for Christians to, to uh, be negatively influenced by the, spirit, the um, secular world that we're living in and to fall into sin. So this is the warning that he's giving. Now, the next thing I have... God's blank against those who blank the warning. Would you cross that out? If you have a pen, just cross that out. I'm glad I had a, a, a second week to work on this message because, you know, this, was, this is not what verses 6 and through 10 says. And instead of God's wrath against those who ignore the warning, write either above it or below it. Would you write God being urged to judge commercial Babylon severely? Maybe that's up here. I'm not sure. Yeah. There it is up there. Would you write that instead? God being urged to judge commercial Babylon severely. Look at verses 6 through 10, and you can see this. The angel is still the one speaking. But look what he says in verse 6. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, there it is again, a lavish lifestyle, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow, and now we see her sinful pride, for she says in her heart, I sit as queen, and am no widow, and will not see sorrow. In other words, Babylon says, hey, I'm the queen. I'm the queen. Nobody's going to dare judge me. And so that is her sinful pride. She says, I'm not, a, I'm not a helpless widow. I'm not a defenseless widow. I'm a queen. Nobody's going to judge me. Well, notice what it says then. Verse 8, therefore her plagues will come in one day. Now, uh, he repeats that over and over. Look at the last line of verse 10. Verse 10, the bottom line 
for in one hour your judgment has come. And then drop down to verse 17, the top line, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. And then go over to verse 19 and look at the last line again, for in one hour she is made desolate. In other words, she's going to be going along, she thinks she's not going to be judged, and all of a sudden, just like that, the judgment falls, and, uh, and there she is. And so God is be, being urged to judge commercial Babylon severely. It goes on to say here, in verse 6, he says, Render to her just as she rendered to you. Now, how did she render to God? What did she do against God? Well, first of all, Babylon is against everything that God stands for. It's in collision course with everything that God stands for. And they're drunk with the blood of the saints. In other words, and the, and, the, and the apostles, all of the, um, um, the Christians who have been killed, this is in the hands of Babylon. That is the tribulation Christians. And so she's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's involved in occultic activities, the worship of the devil, who is the enemy of God. And so this is why they are at such odds. And this is why she's being judged so severely. So verse Eight, therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. So they're living high on the hog, and all of a sudden they're down in the dirt because of the judgment that falls. Verse 10, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And so this is God being urged by the angels to judge commercial Babylon severely. So you have God's case. He's laying out the case against Babylon. And now we see the actual judgment in verses 11 to 24. And the first thing that happens, and see if this sounds familiar to you, the commerce, all commerce is shut down. In other words, the economy is shut down. Man, isn't that what happened about a year ago, this coming March? Everything gets shut down, all the industries, all the unnecessary businesses, as they put it. Everything gets shut down. And in this case, the whole economy gets shut down. Verses 11 through 19. And look at the emotion in these words. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Now this word is going to be repeated over and over. But now in verse 12, he starts a, a list of luxury items, which today, some of these things we take for granted. Verse 12, merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones. That must be diamonds and rubies and emeralds and stuff. And pearls, fine linen and purple. That was the color for royalty at that time and wealthy people. Silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, and fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, and wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and bodies and souls of men, in other words, slaves. The fruit that your soul craved or longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city! That was, that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea stood at a, a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? So now there they are, unemployed, standing in the soup line. The economy is destroyed. They threw dust on their heads. You ever do that? You ever get that discouraged? You th get a glob of dirt and throw it in your hair? That's what they did. They threw dust on their heads and they cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich, 
by her wealth, for in one hour she was made desolate. So all the commerce was shut down. All the merchants are crying their eyes out because it's a total loss, a total destruction of the economy. And then the whole empire is shut down and actually totally destroyed. Verses 20 to 24. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. It's like, you know, you can imagine a, a millstone. They can be pretty big and about that thick sometimes. And he takes that thing and he throws it down into the sea and it just goes boom, paloosh, you know, it goes right down. And he says, and so he says, um, well, let's see. I think I lost my place. Verse 21, okay. Then the mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Now verse 22, the sound of harpists, musicians, and uh, flautists and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. In other words, no more music, no celebrations. A week or two ago, I turned to public television. I think it might have been even Sunday night. And they had this concert in this very, uh, that very famous outdoor venue. And uh, they had John Williams and he was conducting the music that he wrote for Star Wars. And it was so gorgeous. And I thought, what would we do without music? But there's no music during this time. There's no sound of harpists, music, musicians, flautists, tr uh, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. In, in other words, there's no industry. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore because there won't be grain to grind into flour. So you won't hear the millstone. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. Six times that word anymore is, reply, is repeated. <clears throat> and he says, uh, so he says there's not going to be any newlyweds celebrating their honeymoon. It, uh, you know, I suppose people will be getting married. They just won't go on a honeymoon because the economy is just so bad. For your merchants were great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. And I think that's probably the biggest reason for her downfall. So not only is the, com the economy shut down, but the whole empire is shut down and destroyed. Here they were living high on the, claw, high on the hog, and now they are down in the dirt. They were rich, but now they're standing in the soup line. So we've got God's case against Babylon. Then we have the actual judgment of Babylon. And then, you know, someone might be thinking, well, why is God so severe? Because during the seven-year tribulation, we've seen the judgments. We've seen the, the seal judgments. They were severe. Then there are the, the trumpet judgments. Those were even more severe. And then we came to the... Um, well, the bowl judgments, those were really, really severe. And now we see the downfall of religious Babylon, the downfall of commercial Babylon, and these terrible things happening. And we think, why is God so severe? Well, um, these were things that really needed to happen. And so God's judgment is vindicated first by the holy angels in verses 1 through 3. I'm only going to go to verse 4 in this chapter. But the holy angels... They vindicate what God is doing. Verse 1 of chapter 19, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, that means praise the Lord, hallelujah, alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants, shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises forever and ever. Do you see the contrast between the people of earth and how they respond to all of this? They're, they're crying, they're weeping, they're wringing their hands. But in 
Contrast to that, the heavenly response is praise and rejoicing. Now, how can we explain that? And, and not only by the holy angels, but other heavenly beings as well. Do you remember chapter 4 and 5 where John was caught up into heaven and he saw the 24 elders and the other creatures in heaven, heavenly creatures? Look at verse 4, chapter 19. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne. And you say, well, how can you rejoice for this terrible destruction and, and all of these people being killed? Think of it this way. I don't think, I'm sure there's nobody here that's old enough to remember when Germany capitulated and Japan capitulated and Hitler killed himself and all that. Uh, but if you'd have lived during that time, you've seen the scenes like in New York. You remember the big crowds and they're all celebrating. And, and uh, you remember the sailor that finds the nurse and he bends her over and gives her a big kiss. He, he didn't even know her. But there was great celebration when that happened. And uh, when Japan capitulated, too, great celebration, because not only was the war over, but these tyrants were finally deposed. They were finally gone. So I think that's why heaven could rejoice over this. You know, um, there are some things I think we, we see in our society today, and would we ever rejoice if those things could be taken care of, if they could be healed? So... This is the judgment that is coming. Now, for Christians, we don't have to worry about that because the Bible is very clear, especially in the book of Revelation, that when the rapture takes place, we will be in heaven. But uh, uh, there will be those who are not saved, that might be religious, and they'll be part of the religious Babylon. They'll be left behind. And uh, there are some churches, I suppose, they probably won't have a problem with lost attendance even after the rapture. But as far as Christians, the true church will be in heaven with the Lord. And that's the hope that we have. These are things we don't have to go through if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. That's something that you won't have to face. But if you don't know Christ is your Savior and he were to come today, this is the world that you'll find yourself in. And, uh, you know, the good news is the Bible says there will be more people saved during the, during the tribulation time than can be counted. But wouldn't you rather be one of those who's taken up into heaven instead in the rapture? So, dear Heavenly Father, we know that you are a holy and righteous God. And you are a God of judgment, a God of justice. But we thank you that you are also a God of mercy and grace. Lord, there's no sin that you will not forgive. There is no person that you will not forgive. As we come to you for forgiveness, you Give it abundantly, and we're so grateful for that. We do pray for a revival in our nation, Heavenly Father. We do, throughout the world even, that we pray that we would see hundreds of millions of people saved, turning to you and being born again and finding the joy of what it is to know you. Lord, um, with this COVID thing going around, I would have thought that there would have been a big revival, um, that people would really be turning to you, but it doesn't seem to be happening that I can see but I do pray that worldwide we would see a wonderful and huge revival so that when that time comes, those who are saved will be able to look from heaven and see what's happening on earth and not be there in the midst of it. So I just uh, lift those things into your hands. Thank you, Lord, for what you did on the cross to purchase our salvation and what you did in your resurrection to know that we can have new life through you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.